So now we continue our discussion on uh, uh, the object oriented paradigm and we come to the section on fundamental concepts in object oriented languages. We have already talked about the limits of abstract data types. So what are the main characteristics of uh, object oriented languages? Well, first of all, abstraction. We have talked about that in detail. Abstraction entails encapsulation and information hiding. The second point is subtypes, and we talked about a li little bit about that in the previous lecture, about the, the, the compatibility of types. The third point is inheritance, uh, which we ha have also uh, talked about. We said that uh, uh, the problem, one of the problems with the uh, abstract data type is that they do not allow inheritance. And the fourth point, which was also a problem with abstract data type, is dynamic binding, a dynamic method selection, selecting the uh, uh, method to be executed uh, uh, dynamically versus selecting it statically. And uh, here there are four items mentioned, abstraction, subtypes, inheritance, dynamic binding. In, uh, if you look uh, up the main characteristics of object-oriented languages uh, on the net, you often find three items mentioned, abstraction, inheritance, and dynamic binding. So it's often the case that subtypes are, are not mentioned explicitly, and that's not really a surprise because subtypes and inheritance, even though being totally different concepts, they are often uh, achieved by using a single mechanism in in object-oriented languages, uh, meaning uh, the concept of a subclass. So, talking about subclass or class, what is a class? Well, the class is really the abstraction mechanism that is used in object-oriented languages. The class encapsulates the data and, and uh, operations on it. Uh, and uh, also the class provides an interface to the outside world. By looking at the class, the client can see what is the interface. How is the client supposed to use that particular class? And one can also say that uh, the class is a model for a set of objects. Because uh, objects are uh, created by using uh, a certain class. Every object belongs to at least one class. Uh, so we could also say that a class defines constituent members, uh, which enables its in instances to have a state and behavior. So there might be some instance variables uh, or member variables in the class, uh, uh, and those variables can be used to, to give uh, the instances of the class, a particular state or a behavior. And uh, here we have uh, an example class. We have this class counter that we implemented as a, a, an abstract data type earlier. And uh, this is in our pseudo language. Uh, the counter is represented as an int. It is private, meaning it's not accessible to the outside world. And then we have three functions as we had earlier. We have the reset function, we have the get function, and we have the increment function. Uh, and they are all public, meaning that uh, uh, they are accessible to the outside world. A client could call these functions to manipulate uh, the underlying data. So this was the class. So what is the object? Well. As you know, the object is then an instance of the class. We create an instance of a class and we use that instance in our program. Uh, an object can be thought of, uh, of as a record. So some fields of the record corresponds to the data, which may or may not be modifiable. And other fields correspond to the operations that are allowed to manipulate the data. So we could look at thought of it this way, that we have a counter object. X is our data, that's the X that is declared private here in the class. 
And then we have the functions reset, get, and ink. And inside those functions we have some code. Notice here that this keyword this is a reference to the uh, object itself. So this.x equal to zero means that we are initializing the x variable in this current object with the value zero. Return this.x means we are returning uh, the x, the value of the x variable in this object, and so on. So if we step back a little bit and, and think about, okay, what's then the difference between a class or an object versus the abstract data type? Uh, we have seen that in the abstract data type, data and operations are together. And we've seen in the class or in the object uh, that uh, data and operations are together as well. So what's the difference? Uh, well, when we declare a variable of an abstract data type, that variable represents only the data which can be manipulated using the operations. So, for example, if you recall from our counterexample in, in, the, in the abstract data type counterexample, we declared the counter as a, a counter C and then incremented it by calling a function with the counter variable as a, as a parameter. So the variable itself only represented data, not the operations, because we call the operations by sending the variable or the value as a parameter. On the, in contrast, each object, which is an instance of a class, is a container which well, at least conceptually, encapsulates both data and operations. So there is a slight difference there. So continuing with our with the fundamental concept concepts of uh, object-oriented uh, programming, uh, we have methods. We have talked about class. We have talked about objects, and we have methods. We have messages, and we have instance variables. So what are those? Well, the operations that are applied to objects are called methods. These are member functions. They're often called member functions as well. And the methods themselves can access the data items, the instance variables. So if we go back, the instance variable is the in our counter class, or in our counter object, is the, is the variable x. And then we have... Uh, member functions reset, get, and ink. And they're in the object oriented terminology, they're called methods. And the methods can access the data items. For example, the method get can access the instance variable here, x. How do we execute a method? Well, we send a message. So in the object-oriented world, the terminology that is used to, to uh, execute a method is to send a message to an object. And the object that is receiving the message is also an implicit parameter to the invoked method. So that's, that's how it would be implemented. So if we have a uh, a method that we are sending to an object O, we might send some parameters with it. In our example, for example, uh, for the for the counter, we might send the increment uh, message to the O object, where we are assuming that O is already of type a counter. Then we can look at that that way that the uh, an implicit parameter uh, to this increment function is the object itself. But remember this difference between objects and abstract data types that conceptually 
the object really is a container for both the um, uh, for both the uh, data and the operations on it. So there's a difference between saying o dot inc versus inc calling the function inc with c as an explicit parameter. Here we can think of it that uh, o is an implicit parameter to the function. Um, so what about the code for methods? Well, it's kind of, what well, should be kind of obvious that the code for methods is stored only one time in its class. Even though we conceptually look at it this way, that in the object itself we have the instance variable x and then the associated member functions, uh, of course we would not implement it in such a way that um, storing the code inside its object, because then we would be storing, uh, duplicating basically the code for all the objects of this uh, class counter. So the code for the methods is stored only one time in its class, it's not stored in the objects. So when an object needs to execute a specific method, this co code is looked up in the class of which uh, the object is an instance. Um, but the method code must correctly access the instance variables, which are different for every object, um, and therefore not uh, at all stored in the class, but inside the instance. So there is this difference between uh, the member variables being stored in the instance, whereas the code being stored as part of the class. So as we said earlier, the object itself, which is often referred to as this, like in C++, or self, like in Smalltalk, is an implicit parameter to the method being invoked. So we could actually write our void function, uh, oh, sorry, our increment function that we wrote in this way, x is equal to x plus 1. We could write it, for example, in C++, like this this dot x is equal to this dot x plus 1 because this is a, pra is a, is a uh, pointer to the current object. So it's the uh, a more correct way of uh, uh, visualizing this is, th is this uh, diagram here if these boxes at the bottom uh, represent two objects of type counter, then x is the instance variable in the first object, and the second object has another instance variable called x, and the, of course these two instance variables are different. But the code, when, when we execute the increment function for the object on the left, there's a pointer to the code inside the class itself. And the second object has also a pointer to the increment function, but of course that's pointing to the same place. And then when the function executes, the increment function executes its body, it has a reference to the object in question. So this dot x refers to either the object on the left hand side or the object on the right hand side. And how does it know? It's because the increment function gets the this pointer as an as a parameter. Now so we have talked about uh, uh, classes, objects, uh, uh, methods, messages, and uh, instance variables, but some object-oriented languages also allow variables and methods that are associated with the classes themselves, but not the instances, and they are called class variables or, or static variables. <coughs> 
in C++ you can have static variables associated with classes and uh, it means that the, the static variables are really stored in the class itself but not in the objects. Uh, and one can also have static methods uh, but they cannot refer to the this pointer in the body because uh, they don't have any current object. They are associated with the class but they are not associated with the objects themselves. So if we just look at a, an example here in C++ I've, I've implemented the, the counter class so uh, on the public side I have a constructor called counter I have the reset function which resets the value, I have the get function which gets the value, I have the increment function which incre increments the value and then in addition I have actually the, f uh, the member function who which we will talk about a little bit later so just at the moment just ignore that one and then how is the counter represented? Well on the private side I have index uh, and remember the public site in the header file in C++ really represents the interface of the class uh, because this the the functions on the public side are the ones that the client can use and once again notice that uh, there is no implementation here uh, the implementation of the functions are not shown um, even though the representation of the uh, underlying variable is actually shown here but the private part is not part of the interface so in the CPP file the, we have the implementation so what does the constructor do? it simply calls, res calls reset and what does reset do? it sets x to 0 what does the get function do? It just returns x. What does the increment function do? Well, it simply increments x. And we'll talk about the who function later. So on the main side, this the main is the client. The client declares a variable of type counter. And then it calls increment. And now we can see the difference since between the... Uh, implementation or uh, uh, between the way we call the increment function now because the uh, C variable is uh, of type counter which is a class now uh, we can call the function increment without supplying uh, the, f the C type as a formal parameter as we did earlier in, the, in our example for the abstract data type now we just say c.inc instead of what we did earlier was inc and then we supplied c as a uh, parameter so this is the object oriented way of doing it so we call increment twice and then we write out what, the count, what value the counter ha has and we call the get function c.get then we reset the counter and we call the get function again to see what value it has after that. So let's just build this and run. So the counter has value 2 and then we reset it and write it, again, write it out again and we get the counter has value 0. Uh, 